to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to the generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Wednesday, June 28th, we're studying Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 to 27. In today's text, John is shown the New Jerusalem, the holy city coming down out of heaven as the bride for the Lamb. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Philip Hoppe. Pastor Hoppe serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Colby, Kansas. Pastor Hoppe, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Glad to be with you again to this day. So we get started today, Pastor Hoppe. Talk to us in general about the book of Revelation. I know we're here at the very end, but it's always helpful to, to have a good approach, especially to a book like Revelation. How do we need to approach this book as Christians so that it is helpful and useful to us? Well, I think in general, you know, as you guys have been studying this book and your hearers have kind of been listening along, um, you know, there's all sorts of different things that we see in this book and we can kind of get lost in the details. Uh, and yet what we ultimately want to be pointed at is actually what we're studying today, which is this glorious end. Uh, really, uh, you know, we can say it's our end uh, as Christians. We can say it's the end of the biblical story. Uh, we can say it's sort of the end of salvation in the sense of the manifestation of what Christ won for us uh, at uh, the cross and uh, at the empty tomb. And so, you know, I think as we look at this whole book, this is the point we want to get to. Don't get lost somewhere in the middle and never make it here to the end, or you might just go to bed with nightmares, especially if you don't understand it. Uh, but if you get to this point, I mean, oh, the beauty and the, the glory of what we talk about today, uh, this is what Christ has won for us, and this is what is assured to us. Yeah, I mean, there's been various texts throughout the book that are strange, no doubt, and difficult to interpret. And we've, we've done the best that we could with them, and faithful Christians have throughout the ages. But when you get to texts like this, there are just such beautiful texts in the book of Revelation that make those stranger, more confusing texts so worth it to get to a text like this. And and what we'll see in the next chapter as well, this is the, the beautiful, the glorious end that we are waiting for the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. So we're at the end of chapter 21 today. What's the context within the book and any Old Testament context we need to bring to bear on this text today? Right. So I'd say the general context is, I mean, uh, you know, we've had these uh, cycles of uh, sevens in this book, and we're here really at the end uh, of the uh, the third of those cycles, the end of the seventh bowl. And as hopefully your listeners have come to kind of understand, the, the seventh uh, bowl or the seventh, tr seventh trumpet and all of those things, well, they are uh, pictures of what is going to happen at the end. And so that's where we find ourselves. Uh, you've already delved into that a little bit. Obviously, this really starts back in Revelation 17, and we'll talk uh, a little bit about that more later, I suppose. Uh, but first, you know, there's kind of this picture of this um, great prostitute of Babylon. Um, and then now we're switching to a different picture here of uh, this glorious city, which is a picture of the church. And but all of this kind of goes in that same context uh, that the wicked are finally judged and the righteous are finally given that which has been promised to them. Uh, and immediately before this, right, uh, we have heard uh, Jesus say, Behold, I make all things new. And now we're kind of getting a vision of what that new stuff looks like. And of course, uh, we say vision here because even some of the specific words here, again, we can't grasp. And I think we should admit that up front. You know, what is gold that is as clear as crystal? We don't know what that is. But that's part of the language that's used here is to get us to understand that, that it's so glorious, so beautiful, 
uh, that we just can't take it in. The other quick things I guess I would list real quick is that uh, if you go back in the book of Isaiah, particularly in the, the 60th, Uh, And then later in the 65th chapter, we have a lot of talk of the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and new earth. Uh, Then if you go into the book of Ezekiel, uh, in chapters 40 through 48, there's talk of this new final temple. And we'll come back to that too, because we're, in one way, we're told there is no temple. uh, And yet uh, he'll steal all sorts of imagery from Ezekiel's talk of a temple. Yeah. All right. So with all that background in mind, let's take a look at this text. Again, we're starting in Revelation 21, verse 9 today. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life." our text for today. It's Revelation 21, verses 9 to 27. Pastor Robbie, talk about the the angel who comes to show this to John. He's one of the angels who had the seven bowls of the plagues. Those plagues didn't turn out quite as well as what he shows here, it seems. Yeah, certainly. Um, You know, it's interesting that sometimes I think we forget this, that when we're talking about angels or messengers of God in general, Uh, that these messengers uh, always, you know, we talk about pastors now as Lutherans using law and gospel, but this is what God's messengers have always done. And so, yeah, these uh, same angels and this particular angel, right, also uh, speak of these two things. At one moment, they can be, again, speaking of these horrible things that are going to be poured out uh, upon the earth and upon the wicked upon the earth, and then in the next voice, uh, in the next speech, they can be talking about the glorious things that are going to be given uh, to God's people here. And so it doesn't seem that this is a a new angel or a new set of angels at all. Uh, Same angel, but now just bringing a very different message, uh, which again, should not totally surprise us when we understand that the whole of scripture is written with those two different words of law and gospel. And, and maybe even the fact that it is the one of those same angels who's showing John this is a reminder that what we see in those seven plagues and the seven bowls, the seven censers, it's all part and parcel of the same thing. So as we see God's judgment poured out upon the wicked, we are at the same time seeing God's salvation for his own people, that those two things aren't as different as maybe we would otherwise think. 
No, they're essentially the same, meaning that, you know, a lot of what even we're going to talk about when we get into the details of this heavenly city will really give us this sense that the reason why this is such a wonderful place is that the enemies of God are destroyed. They are banished. Uh, there's no need to fear them anymore, right? And so if we don't have that judgment poured out, we would still have the enemies there. You know, we could go back to uh, thinking about when the Israelites went into the promised land, right, and did not uh, complete the task of destroying God's enemies, and that caused trouble uh, forever after that uh, in that area. Uh, and we can rejoice to know that God has completed the work, and therefore the enemies of God are not even a thought that we need to have once we dwell in this holy city. Now, this angel tells John that he's going to show him the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Talk about this labeling for the what we're about to see in this text. Right. So this is something, you know, we've encountered, obviously, before. And again, this is a very common biblical theme, right, that uh, the, the imagery of husband and wife is really a picture of Christ uh, and his bride, the church. Um, and that's what we see here again. Um, we get both here the phrase bride and wife, and it's kind of interesting to me at least that we get both of those in quick succession here because it kind of reminds us that the bride imagery is sort of the consummation, right? This is it beginning, uh, the beginning of eternity, if you will. But then there's this ongoing life as the wife of the Lamb as well, uh, and that's what we in the church have to look forward to. This image comes up just quickly here, then it kind of is dropped in one way because he wants to go on to this uh, metaphor or this vision of the holy city, uh, but it certainly fits with everything we've read in Revelation about this great wedding feast to come, and of course we read that in other places of Scripture as well. Yeah, Revelation 19 especially emphasized the wedding feast imagery, and I do think you're right to, to notice both bride and wife together, both the consummation but also the ongoing husband and wife that will continues for all eternity here. Both are in view. So then in, in verse 10, the angel carries John away in the Spirit to begin to see this. He first goes to a great high mountain, and he sees the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Take us into this imagery that John's beginning to describe. Sure. I think probably the most important thing to understand just in general here is that this language, even uh, the idea of come and I will show you, that exact language is used back in Revelation 17 when this prostitute of Babylon uh, is shown. Uh, and uh, your hearers will probably remember that uh, that prostitute of Babylon there is the, you know, the personification of evil, the enemy of the church, the one who loves falsehood. Um, and there, right, uh, we're carried out into the wilderness to see this creature. Now here we're taken up on a high mountain. And again, in the scriptures, uh, to go up on the high mountain is always to say there's something glorious uh, that's going to happen or that is happening. And here the glorious thing is that we see this holy city, which we know just from the context, right, is actually the church of God uh, and it's coming down out of heaven. And there's, it's sort of an interesting picture here of this kind of descent of this city uh, down into the new heavens and the new earth. But it's sort of one of these times where we get in these verses this real picture that heaven and earth are coming together here. Uh, and why? Well, because God who dwells in the heavens is indeed coming to dwell with his people on this new heaven and new earth. Uh, in fact, I think it uh, is in Ezekiel uh, where he talks about this new temple. And one of the things he says is the, the name of that place will be the Lord dwells there, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the whole point. Yeah, that's how the book even ends, I think. That's the very last thing Ezekiel sees with that new temple. The other contrast that I, I noticed between this bride of Christ, the church, and the great prostitute of 17 was not only the wilderness versus the, the mountain, but also that she's seated on the many waters, and now the church is coming down out of heaven. You know, the waters being that place of, of chaos and evil in the scriptures, the sea that is no more, we know, but now coming down out of heaven, 
this new Jerusalem, this holy city, has a, a divine uh, creation. She is his own bride. She has been prepared for him as the bride. She comes down from heaven. And this is what John's seeing. Describe the, or talk to us about the appearance that John describes in verse 11 as he begins to, to go into more detail as to what he's seeing. Yeah, so this is one of these phrases, and I I apologize for this whole episode that I'm not exactly a gemologist, uh, and uh, I was glad you read uh, all the 12 stones, and I'll probably try to avoid doing so. (laughs) But uh, here we're told that this city, right, has the glory of God. Even that phrase is something, right, that it possesses, it emanates the very glory of God. And, And we could go, how's this possible for the church to do this. Well, it's only possible because God has made it possible in Christ Jesus. But we get this, then we're told it has the radiance um, like a jasper. Uh, And again, everything I understand about jasper is that, uh, you know, in our world, the jasper is sort of an opaque kind of stone that you can't see through. And yet we're told here it's as clear as crystal. And again, I think a lot of that language is just to give us the grandeur. It's kind of like, Well, if you think you can imagine what a jasper is, let me throw you a little bit and tell you it's not even like a jasper on earth. It's it's more beautiful than that. But the thing we probably should recognize um, is that also earlier in in Revelation, uh, jasper is the stone that is spoken of uh, as sort of being there as the appearance of God. It's it's that's his radiance is that of the jasper stone. And so again. You know, how glorious that God has given to us the same appearance, the same radiance that he has. Um, And this is where we get this idea that truly Christ's righteousness has been given to us. It has been imputed to us, and it is ours. The, The language here to me is ontological, right? This holy city is not trying to act like it has the radiance of a jasper. It does by God's grace and by his mercy in Jesus. Talk a little bit more about that, because you know, we're talking here about the holy city coming down out of heaven, this new Jerusalem, and we are seeing her for all that she is, but you're also describing things that are, are true now. So I mean, talk a little bit more about how these things are true of the church now, at least in some sense, and then like we're going to see them on the last day? Is that, I mean, is that kind of where... Talk more about that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. It's, you know, it's this thing where we can already now know that we have the glory of God placed upon us. That's a baptismal reality for us that we have this. And yet, right, when we look at the church on earth, we say, gosh, I don't see quite that radiance there. But the temptation, I think, is to say, well, it's not really there. It'll only be there on the last day. But that would be if we judge by our experience. If we judge by the word of God, the church of God, as we have that one hymn says, right? The church of God elect and glorious, right? It's already now that way. Uh, We just can't fully see it. Um, And so, yes, it's going to be wonderful on that last day to finally see what God has done for his people in all of its fullness that our eyes and our experience won't be able to even trick us into a moment of doubt about what God has said, because it will be there right before our senses on that day. Yeah, the, the hymn, Church of God, Elect and Glorious, I think is a good one to keep in mind. The Church is One Foundation is another hymn that I think explores this reality of we are this right now, but we don't see it. And as we live in that church militant, as you might say, seeing a vision like this of the church, church triumphant, brings us hope, brings us courage to continue to live faithfully even now in the midst of of this world and its great tribulation. So John's vision continues. He's seen the city with the radiance like Jasper. As you said, this is the the same word that was used back in Revelation 4 to describe God on his throne, and here the church is described in that way. He also sees now this city, and he begins to see some of the details, and these are going to be a little more familiar to us, although there's, there's things that are unusual about this city. There's lots of 12s. So take us into some of these descriptions we get in verses 12 and following. 
Yeah, uh, I was thinking, yeah, we can kind of say this this city is 12 sized, right? It's uh, kind of every number here is either 12 or a, a multiple of 12 uh, or, a, you know, times a thousand or, you know, but something that basically has its root in 12. Uh, and, and it begins all here. Although the first thing we get is interestingly this, you know, high wall. Later we'll get the measurement of how high. Uh, but it's interesting that, you know, even today, I think when we think about a walled city or a walled nation, uh, which we don't have as many of as the ancient world had, uh, we still think, well, yeah, you got to have the wall for protection, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yet there's this contrasting image here that there are also 12 gates in this 12 wall, 12, or excuse me, in this wall. Um, and that kind of reminds us here uh, especially later when we'll be told that these gates remain open, there's no real danger that's here anymore. And yet we still have some of these images that are there throughout Scripture to remind us of God's protection, right? It's almost like you look at the wall and you say, I'm secure here. And then, you know, you peek out the gate and go, oh, yeah, because God destroyed all of his enemies. They're not there anymore. You know, we wouldn't even quote unquote, need the wall, this very high wall. Uh, but yet he still gives us that as an additional comfort. Um, the 12 gates, right? Uh, one of the things we get here, of course, is that the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel are inscribed on those. And this idea of kind of three gates on either side, uh, this is kind of a lot of the imagery here does flow right from Ezekiel's um, talking about uh, the new temple. Um, and yet, again, we'll, we'll talk here in a little bit about how there is no temple and maybe why that is. But I think when we see here, first we get this picture that there is this foundation of Jacob, of Israel, of the 12 tribes, um, God's people. And again, we remember that even in the Old Testament, this was not a group that was only constituted by bloodline. In fact, Jesus would remind us that even in the Old Testament, it was always by faith, right, that this group was constituted. But we did see a literal nation. We did see literal tribes, literal descendants. Um, and so we're given, I don't know, do we want to say half the picture here of the uh, total church? The Old Testament church is kind of uh, given to us here in this picture of these gates with the sons of Israel's names inscribed on them. Yeah, and, I, and of course, you know, in the next verse, then you have the 12 foundations, and there are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. We've seen the number 24 before with the elders, and we've talked about how that's representative of the whole church. You've got 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament, 12 apostles of the Lamb in the New. Here you see them together, and I, I think the one of the significances of that in this chapter goes to what we were talking about a little bit before, that even as we're seeing the heavenly Jerusalem here, the way that Dr. Franzman in his commentary talks about it is its roots are already planted, and those roots can be seen in the Old and New Testament in these two twelves, the tribes of Israel and the apostles and the New. Yeah, right, exactly. I think you're right that this does kind of give us a, a rootedness in the history that we see in the scriptures, that this heavenly reality is not just something completely new that pops out of nowhere. Uh, rather, it is the very kingdom of God that's been coming upon earth that's now manifested here uh, in this new heaven and new earth. Um, yeah, certainly this stuff that's going to happen is ours now, and that's because our Lord Jesus is now, right? I mean, it, and we have him already. Um, it's hope for us now. It's not quite a full reality, but it is something that we can say, yeah, hey, right now, right, we know what it is to be built on the foundation of the apostles, right? This is why we say we believe in an apostolic church. This is why we confess um, the doctrines that we believe to have been taught by the apostles, uh, which they were taught by the Lord himself and by his Holy Spirit. And so, uh, yeah, it's a present reality for us. And again, we're going to see it in all its glory on that last day. 
to the the thought of the wall and the gates at the same time because on the one hand a, a wall is there for protection and gates generally would have been the weak points I mean, you can think through any number of of sieges that you've read about or you've maybe seen depicted on a movie where do you attack it's usually at the gate that's going to be the weakest point so you've got a, a bit of a contrast here and i, I wonder if on the one hand, with the wall, you know that there's no danger, no enemy can attack you, but with the gates, you know that the access is open, and and it's open through Christ, uh, only him. That's the, the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles, again, that's the way that's open. My mind goes a little bit to John 14, verse 6, where Jesus says, he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So on the one hand, all the enemies, all those things that are outside of Christ, they can never get in. But on the other hand, all who are in Christ have free and easy and open access because of what he's done for us. Yeah, I think it's Dr. Brighton in his commentary. He talks about the gates being a symbol of abundant entrance is the phrase mm-hmm. he uses, right? So, and that's that's exactly the idea there that you're talking about that, um, you know, when you don't have to worry about who else is going to get in, well, you can leave the gates wide open and that's exactly what God has done, that anyone who believes, there's no further uh, test of whether you'll get in or not, right? It's those who believe and trust in Christ alone, who have received his grace uh, in his church. Those are the people that are going to get in, and all of them, like you said, and there's not going to be any trouble. You're not going to have to trample over somebody else to get in. Plenty of ways uh, for you to enter into this place that God has promised and now delivers to you. And again, that way is open right now in the church through Christ Jesus. That is the good news that we proclaim. We're going to keep looking at this glorious vision of St. John on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking about Revelation 21 with Pastor Philip Hoppe this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, June 28th. We are studying Revelation 21, verses 9 to 27 with Pastor Philip Hoppe. He serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Colby, Kansas. Pastor Hoppe, prior to the break, we were talking about the wall, the gates of this city. And then John sees the angel, the one who spoke with him, now has a measuring rod of gold, and he's going to measure the city beginning in verse 15. Talk to us about the measurements of the city and their significance. Yeah, so anytime something is sort of measured out, it seems to be in the Bible to sort of set it apart, right? To uh, speak about the fact that God is going to lay his particular favor and blessing upon uh, that place. And the interesting thing here is the actual uh, measurements. Um, And first that we get this, we don't usually think of this, right? But he gives us this idea that the city is a cube, right? He tells us that it is, you know, 1,200 stadia uh, length, width, and height, right? So, and why? You know, we might say that. Again, we might talk about length and width of a city, But the height, why is that? Well, this all leads us to remember that this is exactly how the Holy of Holies in the temple was designed, that it was a cube there in the center of the temple where God dwelled was this perfect 12, if you will, here in the the language we've got here. Uh, And it's just amazing to think about the fact now that the entire city is sort of the temple. And try not to confuse here, but this is part of why we're going to be told there is no temple, because God dwells everywhere. 
In times past, God had to dwell in the temple because of the presence of sin. And you had to sort of go there to the temple uh, to be in God's presence. And of course, you couldn't go right into the Holy of Holies uh, even then. But there was this idea that God's radiance, his glory was there but it was sort of inaccessible in a lot of ways, right? Except through the means which he had dictated, through the sacrifices, through the Day of Atonement, things like that. Um, and here we get this whole city looks like the Holy of Holies. So wherever you go, you're in God's presence. Uh, the size here is amazing, right? I mean, something like 1,400, 1,500 miles cubed. And I, I tried to look this up. And I think if I did the math right, you know, if we just take kind of the square footage of New York City, that would be something like 70 miles in each dimension. Um, and one of the other things uh, I read today was that some people think this is actually sort of a estimation of what the size of the entire Roman Empire would have been. And that's kind of a cool thought when you think about all the things, you know, I'm sure you've discussed with uh, various people about how much of this relates to the present moment of Rome uh, and the things going on then and how much of it is just about, you know, the future at the end. Uh, but here we might have one of those intersections where maybe partially this number is also kind of a picture of because to those people, again, the Roman Empire would have been the whole world, essentially. And so he gives this wild number and he says, but it's one city. And guess what? God's everywhere in that whole space. Uh, what a what an amazing thing to even try to ponder. Yeah, that, that's a that's an interesting thing. If it really is related to the size of the Roman Empire, that would be quite the quite the the mark that the Lord gives here. I did. I, I saw your note about New York City, so I, I looked up some areas uh, in the United States, and and I went with the the Lutheran Study Bible, or I guess it's the ESV footnote, suggests that twelve thousand stadia is about thirteen one thousand three hundred eighty miles. So I squared that, and that gives you a square mileage of about one point nine million. The state of Alaska, which is the biggest state in terms of land area in the United States, is like six hundred sixty five thousand square miles. Uh. So. We're talking a land area here of about three states of Alaska is wow. how big, or or the entire another like the entire western half of the United States, the contiguous forty eight plus Alaska. That would give you about that same land area. Of course, in in this perfect square, and then the cube as you're talking about the height. I didn't even bother trying to figure out the height because that's just a. I mean, it's a, it's long enough without thinking about that being that <laughs> tall as well. I know there's no buildings that get anywhere close to that. No, this is absolutely. just an incredible dimensions though that we're talking about. But I I think I, I would I would love for the the thing with the Roman Empire to be true because that would really just make this. I mean, so much more memorable, especially for the people that John's writing to when they see this empire. And it's got John in exile right now to know that they're going to dwell and, in fact, are dwelling right now in this eternal city, which, I mean, I don't know, Rome was called the eternal city. I think we've talked about that. You know, and here is the real eternal city, and, and what a, just what a glorious vision. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is amazing in every way. And again, uh, you know, the, the dimensions can't help but make you... Uh, be in awe, right? They're not, yeah. again, you, you you can kind of say, well, look at this. That's not even as big. That's as best as right. you can do, right? You can't go like, well, it's a little bit smaller than, you know, it's that's like, right. it, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So this is what John's saying. Now, he also gives the length or the, the height, excuse me, of the wall, 144 cubits. What about, what about that dimension? Yeah. So, I mean, again, of course, here we have another 12, uh, you know, this goes back to, uh, or doesn't go back to, but we remember the 144 uh, thousand um, uh, earlier in Revelation. Uh, but here again, just think of, you know, if I did the math right here again, you know, a 200 foot wall. Um, wow. Again, that's, that would be something to behold. I mean, I, again, I didn't look up uh, other walls, but I don't think most walls would come anywhere near uh, 200 feet, right? It's, it's kind of like a, a skyscraper, turned into a wall. 
Um, and, and so again, and the other interesting thing here is we get this little comment that it's a human measurement, but it's also an angel's measurement. Yeah. That's, um, what is that? Yeah. I don't, I don't know exactly what that means, but I, I think maybe it speaks a little bit again about this idea that heaven and earth are coming together. Right. So whether it's John that got out there with his, uh, you know, tape measure or whether it was one of the holy angels, they'd say, yep, that's how big it is. Right. And they would agree and, and it kind of speaks about this is something for our hopes, too, is that yeah, the, the heavenly stuff is not ultimately going to be beyond us. Right now, that seems, you know, it seems like a dream. But no, it's actually going to be a real place that we are going to dwell. Um, it's, it's, you know, this beautiful place where we have the right to walk. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I was thinking, too, that on the one hand, there are parts of this vision that John uses words in it, like we can't really picture them, we're not quite sure what he's describing. But on the other hand, we do have an assurance, I think, from a statement like that, that it's not going to be unrecognizable, it's not going to be completely foreign, it is going to be new, this renewed heavens and new earth, we talked about that in the introduction to this chapter, the first eight verses, but it's going to be something that that we will will know, in a sense. I mean, that's not going to be entirely foreign. God's going to take what has been broken by our sin and make it brand new, renewed, perfect, so that it won't be entirely unrecognizable, but we will we will live there just like we always should have, I guess, something like that. Yeah, no, I think maybe one of the ways to think about this is how the Scriptures speak about our renewed bodies or to look at Christ's resurrected body, that it has characteristics that are very familiar, right? Jesus says, hey, give me a piece of fish and I will eat it, right? Uh, Touch me. You see, I have bones and I have flesh. So there is something very familiar. And yet, of course, he can just show up in a room, which most of us with bodies can't do, right? So uh, there's something that's next level, but it is not totally divorced from the reality that you and I already know. And to me, there's a great comfort in that. I always tell people, I remember as a kid sometimes thinking, do I want to go to this place called heaven? Because as it had been described to me, it seemed completely foreign to even what I knew, right? We're just floating around on clouds, playing harps, whatever. And, you know, when I really started to learn the scriptures better and say, wait, it's this perfect place that is kind of like what I know, but without all the bad stuff and stuff that's even next level. Yeah. Why would I not want to be there? Right. And thanks be to God that he would give me that opportunity, though, though I be but a sinner, right? By his grace, I will go. Yeah. Now, as John continues his description, he he continues to look at the wall and the foundations. Here we see the reminder of the jasper again, and we've got the city being a pure gold, but that's as clear as glass, whatever that exactly means. And then we get to that list of the the twelve jewels, which I will not attempt to pronounce yet again. <laughs> I was, you know, you're used to not pronouncing names in the Old Testament very well, but here, twelve jewels. And I'm not sure if, if we're in, supposed to understand each one as the particular name that's given. I think there's sometimes some difficulty in, in translating from the Greek as to what exactly they were referring to. But we've got the 12 nonetheless. What is the significance overall of these things and any specifics that you can give us in those, those details? Well, I think first and foremost, again, it is just about the glory, the splendor uh, of what we're seeing, right? Um, that there's all these different gems and there's all this gold and it's gold that's even better than the, the shiniest gold that you could see on earth. So I still think that's the basic thing here, right? I mean, it, even the phrase as it's translated, you know, adorned with every kind of jewel, right? There's nothing that God couldn't take uh, in all of creation and bring into this glorious vision and this glorious reality that we will live in. Um, So I think that's the first thing. Um, People, of course, speculate, you know, obviously this is all these 12s, so we get uh, here 12 gems. Uh, but the the thing from the Old Testament that we might reference here is in Exodus 28, um, we're having described to us the things that the high priest is to wear. And on his breastplate, there are 12 stones there. Um, and, and maybe even, right, there are these particular stones. We don't know uh, for certain. 
Um, but that, again, was kind of a reminder of the people of God, uh, that the high priest was uh, representing before God, even as he was representing God to those people. Um, and so I think here, you know, it's interesting, too, that that breastplate back there is called the breastplate of judgment. Um, and I think, you know, we can say here, too, this is what we mean by when we say we believe that Jesus will come and be our judge. When we say that in the Te Deum is judge, yes, the enemies of God in wrath, but also judge us by redeeming us and giving us all of these things, right? Now just one mediator, no high priest other than Jesus is needed. Uh, but again, I think mostly this just shows the fullness and the glorious uh, nature of what we will experience one day. Mm, yeah, I, I mean, if there is a connection to be made to the, the garments of the high priest, within that description in Exodus 28, the Lord tells Moses that what's going to happen when the high priest goes in with these gemstones and their names written this will bring the people of Israel into the remembrance of the Lord. And so this eternal remembrance that the Lord has for his people, perhaps there's a, a connection to be made there with these 12 brilliant gemstones being a part of the foundations of this city. Now, the gates as well are described as, as pearls. What's the background for the pearls? Well, interestingly, pearls uh, are never mentioned in the Old Testament. So maybe this is one of those things, you know, uh, I, again, I'm not, uh, I, I guess I don't have enough money to spend on gems to know what are the most highly prized gems in the world now. But I'm sure just like anything that, you know, in one generation, this particular gem is worth a lot more than it would be in another um, generation. Um, but here we're, we're just kind of given this idea that in the New Testament times, pearls were highly prized, right? I mean, uh, you know, Jesus uh, being called that pearl of uh, great price, right? Uh, all these kind of pictures don't, uh, you know, throw out pearls before swine, all these different images. And so here again, I think it is simply that um, it's using something that was highly prized to say, again, these uh, gates, every part of this city is made of something valuable. I don't know what to take of the fact, you know, it makes a big deal that it's a single pearl. I guess the only thing I can think there is, again, with most gemstones, the bigger, the better. Uh, and so maybe it's, again, just a statement of grandeur here that you didn't need five or six to make the gate that's so big, uh, so valuable that you just need one per gate. Yeah, this is, and just as a, an aside, but I, I think it's important, the, the great Lutheran hymn, Wake, Awake, for Night is Flying, references this this very verse from Revelation in the third stanza, where we sing, of one pearl each shining portal. That's a reference to each gate being made of a single pearl. So, I mean, you know how this goes with hymnody, Pastor Hoppy. Sometimes you're singing something like, wait, what did I just sing? That's what you just sang when you sing, wake, awake, night is flying. It's from this verse. So as John continues to see then, we get to this detail. You've brought it up a couple times. We need to talk about it. There's no temple in the city because the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Why is, why is that significant? Yeah, so again, to me, it's sort of like we can say that the whole city is the temple, uh, and I think we could broaden it then to say, and the city is the whole world. Now, again, I've I've read some people that say, you know, we want to kind of see still the city as sort of this, you know, the the source of life, the source of water that sort of flows out of the city, that that's the image. But But the overall point being, this whole picture says the whole thing is now where God dwells. Uh, and since he is the temple, uh, and Jesus, of course, made this very clear, right? Tear down this temple and I will rebuild it uh, in three days. Um, we understand that this is what the temple always was about, right? Was about the presence of God. If if God's not in the temple, it's just a building with a lot of gold. Uh, and certainly in our day and age, there are still a lot of buildings uh, with a lot of gold in them or on them that have no particular um, value as far as anything eternal. 
Uh, but here we are given this beautiful picture that we don't even need a temple because we don't need to shelter off God in one part of this new creation. He can go everywhere, right? He can walk in the cool of the day and God's people, right, can be there with him without any fear, without any need of going and, and finding uh, fig leaves, so to speak. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to talk more about that in the next in the next text where we see that tree of life and different kinds of leaves and again the fact that the Lord is there. That's what makes this eternal life. He is the one dwelling there. So you you mentioned Ezekiel seeing a temple. He sees a, a new temple in the last part of his book. This verse taken together with that informs what Ezekiel is seeing then, I think. Yeah. I I think I mean most simply, he's seeing Jesus. Right, yeah. Jesus is that temple, which, again, is why um, we don't need to get caught up in nonsense about building a third temple uh, here on earth, because we are blessed to live already uh, in and with that third temple, Jesus. Uh, talk about then, in connection with this, you've got the te- no temple because the Lord is there, the Lamb is there as the temple, then also because of the presence of the Lamb, there's no need of a, a sun or moon. Talk about the, the aspect of light. Well, obviously, I mean, this takes us way back to Genesis and think about how important, obviously, the sun and moon are to the creation account and no doubt how important they are to us today. And so it is hard for us to imagine a place that would not need a sun and moon. Uh, Also, because we're so in this rhythm of day and night, right, that we have experienced uh, since creation Uh, But here we're told, right, and this can almost, you know, we got to stop and listen because sometimes we can hear there's no night. And to some people, they can go, man, I'm starting to get tired, right? Like I (laughs) kind of like night, right? I like to go to sleep. But in the Bible, right, night is darkness and night or and darkness is evil. Um, it's threats, right? Uh, this is the fear of the dark that many people experience, that unknown of evil lurking around. Well, there's none of that anymore. And so it's daylight always. And it's not, you know, that you're going to weary of this. You're actually going to rejoice. You know, this is that time when you're having the best time of your life outside. And then the sun goes down and you kind of go, oh, man, I wish I would have had a couple more hours of daylight, right? Well, you've got all the daylight you could ever want. And that daylight's not coming from the S-U-N, but from the S-O-N, right, from Jesus Uh, and from God, uh, their radiance, their glory lighting up the entire city. That's right. So then in the next verses, John also talks about the nations walking in this light, which when I I was reading that earlier, that goes, I was reminded of what you were saying earlier about this being not a place of floating around on clouds, but a place of actual life. So the, the nations are actually walking in this light. And John says that the kings of the earth bring their glory into it. They bring their glory, the honor of the nations. What does that mean? Well, I know uh, even in the things I read, there's a lot of different interpretations of this. And I guess the one that seems most fitting to me is that we're actually talking about the fact that when we talk about the nations here, generally in the Bible, we're talking about nations other than Israel. And I think here we're simply saying that indeed there are believing nations and that these believing nations now are bringing sort of the spoils of all the victory God has given them uh, into this city. Um, You know, it is true in Revelation that a lot of places the nations are those opposed to Christ and his kingdom. But I think here it's really speaking of those nations um, whose God is the Lord. And, and we want to be careful there, but I, I don't know, I'm beginning to think we overcorrect on this. You know, we say like, well, we don't want to, you know, go too far with this idea of a Christian nation, um, you know, as America or anything like that. But let us never lose the fact that one of our aims, one of our goals is that all nations would follow God's ways, right? Um, and that God does seem to be a respecter of nations. I I don't know how to fully take that in either. We like to think just in terms of individuals, but he also is a respecter of nations. And I think there's nations here. He's saying these are nations. And again, it's not to say that every person in them was a true believer, but in one way or another, uh, they're coming here now to enjoy with the rest of the church of God, this glorious place, and they're bringing anything with them uh, that God has already given them on this earth. 
Yeah, I mean, when thinking about the the honor and the glory that they bring, there was a couple of places that came to my mind. One is within the book of Revelation. In Revelation 14, verse 13, John hears a voice say, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And then the Spirit echoes that, saying, Blessed indeed, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. We talked a little bit about that, the deeds following them. I wonder if that's related to this idea of the nations bringing in their glory and their honor. The other thought that I had was maybe there's a connection we could make to the the Magi, especially thinking about the way that Isaiah talks about them in Isaiah chapter 60, that they'll bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. Maybe that's a another place to think about what it means that the nations are going to bring their glory and honor. They're going to to lay down their their gifts before him, recognizing that it all came from him anyways. Yeah, I think that's perfect. And also, like you said, they're also offering up their praise, which, of course, throughout this book of Revelation is clear that this is, you know, if there's something we are offering up uh, in heaven, uh, of course, again, in response to what God has given to us, but we are, we're singing, we're praising, right? Just like we get a picture of already now in the church, right? That God gives to us and we sing and uh, rejoice in all that he gives. Now, just like we saw yesterday with the text from 1 to 8 in this chapter, we've talked a lot about the glory, the beauty, but there's also a note about who does not enter here at the end, which might seem like a downer, but on the other hand, as we started off, when God saves his people, that means the defeat of the enemies. And so we want to see these things together. Talk to us about what's going on there in verse 27 about that which does not enter this holy city. Yeah, I guess I'd summarize it this way, that so far we've been talking about heaven, this new heaven and new earth being glorious because of what is there, these gates, these gems, all of this. And now we're told why heaven is glorious because of what's not there. And while, again, as long as we have breath on this earth, we should pray for the conversion of those who do not believe, uh, and we should love our enemies by telling them of Christ and praying for their conversion, we do know that in the end, for God to bring about his salvation, it does mean the destruction of those who unrepentantly will not believe. Uh, And therefore, this is part of what makes heaven heaven also, is the fact that nothing impure will enter into it, right? Every once in a while, you might have that thought. Um, I know we were just looking at the book of Genesis in in the Bible, um, in our Bible class, I should say, yesterday in church. And, you know, there was always this question, you know, why did God allow Satan to slither his way in there, right? And again, uh, I'll let you answer that one, you know, on a different uh, podcast. (laughs) But the beautiful thing is here, not a chance, Not a chance that's going to happen here. That guy, he's down in the abyss, right? He's in the lake of fire and all the people with him. And so we don't have to worry that anything's going to mess up this perfection because the only people there are those who are perfected, made clean by the blood of Jesus. And of course, Jesus himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the whole crew there, but everyone perfectly clean Uh, not those who do what is detestable or false. Pastor Hoppy, we have about a minute left on the morning. Help us to wrap things up on this glorious text from Revelation 21. Well, I guess we could just go to the end words here, right? Only those whose names, you know, are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's who's going to be there. And guess what, dear child of God? That's you. And you should rejoice in this. Remember when the apostles went out and they were able to cast out demons uh, and they were able to heal diseases and they come back and are excited. And Jesus says, don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Uh, For all those listening who trust in Christ, know this is the great hope and the comfort of this book. Since your name is written in the book, and it has been before the foundation of the earth, all this great stuff we just talked about, it's yours now, and you will see it in reality with your eyes. Praise be to Jesus uh, for making that all possible through his death and resurrection. Pastor Philip Hoppe is pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Colby, Kansas. He has been helping us today to study Revelation 21, verses 9 to 27. Pastor Hoppe, thanks for being our guest today. Very good to talk about a text like this. 
I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. What a glorious vision that John receives, the glory of the church that we know now by faith, and the glory that we look forward to seeing on the last day, living forever with our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have any questions about Revelation 21, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a joy to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.